Welcome back to another episode of So You Think You're a Gamer. I'm your host, Colossal Kiwi, and today we're going to be talking about the Dead Island series. It's a little game series you might be familiar with, maybe you've played it, maybe you've just heard about it, you've seen the trailers, but only a true epic gamer can answer the following question. How many entries are there in the Dead Island franchise? Is the answer A. 2 B. 4 C, 7, or D, 10. Go ahead, take as much time as you need to think about it. You can phone a friend, look it up on Wikipedia. Hey, you know what? You can even go ahead and ask the audience. But they're wrong because the answer is 10. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. The answer is at least 10. And I recently came to this realization. It's been driving me nuts. And if I have to live with the burden of this knowledge, you guys do as well. So in this video, I'm going to try to keep my cool as I teach you about the entire insane history of Dead Island. And I'm going to do that without spoiling a single game in the franchise. But before I get into that, it's time for a little word from today's sponsor. All right, gamers, after an extreme day of slaying zombies, you need rest, extreme rest. And now you can get it with X Sheets, the only LED powered bed sheets made for gamers. <laughs> I'm just kidding, real gamers can sleep anywhere, obviously. And real gamers also want the ultimate console gaming experience on mobile, which is why this video was brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. That's right, boys, just a month after going full time, we got the Raid sponsorship. I, I feel like this is the epiphany of don't let your memes be dreams. So come on, join me. You've got over 600 unique champions to choose from. Turvold is my favorite, obviously. I mean, just look at that glorious beard and there's also a bunch of cool stuff happening this month you've got new champions an update to tag arena special events and tournaments with the main event being the deliana chase where you get your hands on deliana herself a brand new legendary champion from the high elves faction and all you've got to do is log in and play raid for seven days and you'll get one of the strongest support champions in the entire game come on admit it you've seen the memes you've been tempted to try raid for a while and there's no better time to get started than right now you get to support my channel and if you click the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen, you get a free starter pack with almost 40 bucks. You get Misery Cord, Tiger Soul, and Romero 3 badass champions, and a bunch of bonus XP brews. And if you take it one step further and use promo code MYDALIANA once you're in the game, you'll instantly boost her to max level and get a bunch of resources so that you're all set for mass destruction. Thank you, Raid Shadow Legends, for sponsoring my video. And now, let's journey back to where it all began. It all started with the 2011 release of one of the most unforgettable trailers for any form of media ever. This was the first time the world got a look at Dead Island. Or was it? Footage of Dead Island originally started surfacing as far back as 2007, with Techland proudly showing off their gore and visual damage mechanics. In an interview back then, Pavel Kopinski, who you may recognize from a billboard in Dying Light, talks about melee combat, the inclusion of RPG elements like different factions that you can side with, and the video even finishes by stating that the game was set to release in 2008. And I guess they decided that they needed more time to make it not look like one of those early 2000s horror games that used to scare me as a kid whenever I went to the arcade. And it's a good thing they did, because look how amazing that 2011 trailer is. It just so beautifully set the scene of a gorgeous island resort, contrasted by the tragic death and horror that now encompassed it. The only thing is, the game itself was completely different. That infamous trailer was created by an animation studio named Axis Productions, and it told this beautifully tragic story that the goofy vibe of the actual game just didn't match. I distinctly remember just how confused yet completely hyped I was when I booted up the game for the first time and I was met with that iconic who do you voodoo cutscene. I mean, you can tell there are certain moments in the game where they really tried to tug at your heartstrings, but the narrative just wasn't really well executed. Really, the areas where Dead Island shined were all of those features that they originally advertised back in 2007. 
The way that my friends and I described the game back when it launched was that it was like if Dead Rising and Borderlands had a beautiful, gory love child, right? You got like the brutal melee combat, an in-depth crafting system with all kinds of crazy weapon modifications, open world questing, weapon rarities, skill trees with talent points, and all kinds of RPG elements that the industry had just never seen bundled into one zombie game before. It was kind of like a first person looter and shooter, but with the shooting replaced by hacking and slashing. Speaking of friends, co-op really was the way to experience this game, especially since you didn't really have a strong story to keep you immersed in single player, so instead, the best approach was to treat the entire island of Banoi like a zombie infested playground for you and your buddies to wreak havoc in. You had four different playable characters to choose from, each with their own skill trees and special fury moves, also known as rage moves, and there was very little crossover between those skill trees. Each character really did play in a unique way, offering a fair bit of replayability for the game. I mean, you had the one-hit wonder and blunt weapons expert Sam B, you had the retired football player and throwing expert Logan, there was the bodyguard and firearms expert Pona, and of course the undercover agent and sharp weapons expert Shin Mei. Now, while there isn't really a factions system in the final product, you do encounter several different groups of survivors, all led by different characters. Like, there's the Lifeguard Tower crew, which is led by Cinemoy, and he acts as a narrative centerpiece for pretty much the majority of the game. Not to mention, in a single-player DLC, we even got the chance to play as one of the main story characters, Ryder White. Now, this DLC does a pretty decent job of fleshing out the story of Dead Island and providing the player with context that they previously didn't have. And while we're talking about DLC, there were a couple of weapons that were added as well as an entire horde mode in the form of Bloodbath Arena, which was pretty fun and it did come with its own unique weapons. Overall, the game was met with very mixed reception from a lot of people who just didn't dig the janky, glitchy, goofy vibes that so strongly contrasted the polish of that breathtaking trailer. But for others, like myself, there was something so beautiful about that janky gameplay that just kept players coming back, especially in co-op. I mean, name a better bonding activity than driving underwater. Go ahead, I'll wait. Speaking of waiting, just a couple years later in April 2013, we got our hands on Dead Island Riptide, a full-priced AAA sequel to the game that is best thought of as Dead Island 1.5. Same graphics, same engine, new mechanics, and a much shorter story. They even hyped this game up with a similar dramatic CGI trailer, with the same disconnect between the gameplay and the serious tone of that trailer. Perhaps the biggest addition was a new playable character named John Morgan, a fist weapons expert that allowed TechClan to expand upon hand-to-hand -hand combat. With Riptide, they also raised the level cap and accommodated this by expanding each character's skill tree and adding new universal skills, including a whole new group fury system. They also introduced a separate leveling system specifically for weapon skills that all of the characters can benefit from. And if you wanted a bit of a boost from the beginning of the game, you had the option to import one of the original four characters from your Dead Island 1 save files. Riptide also introduced a few new weapons like the nail gun, the harpoon gun, the sniper rifle, the rocket launcher, all of which could aid you in the all new tower defense style quests where you set up a base and defend it against waves of the undead, even giving you the ability to upgrade your fences with electricity and even upgrade the damage of the NPCs around you by doing little quests for them and giving them new weapons. Now, one thing I can't go without mentioning is the fact that the game is called Riptide, it has a flooded jungle, and it even has a new enemy type called Drowners, yet the zombies themselves don't take drowning damage anymore. Overall, Riptide did a decent job of expanding upon the features of the first game while providing a pretty lackluster story experience, all of which would have been much better suited as a big DLC expansion pack, kind of like Dying Light the following for anyone familiar with Techland's later games. You could tell it was pretty quickly thrown together, and overall Riptide just didn't warrant the full 60 US dollar AAA price that it released with. And also, I nearly forgot to mention this, with Riptide, Sam B even released a new single, No Room in Hell, featuring Chameleon Air of all people, and while it is pretty fun to listen to, 
it just doesn't have that same charm of who do you voodoo which feels like a pretty apt analogy for the two games <laughs> But for anyone who felt let down by Riptide, their luck had immediately changed. Only two months after Riptide's release, a whole new IP was announced at E3 2013. A game that would combine all the best parts of Dead Island with a horror survival atmosphere and a whole new movement system for traversing the environment. This was the moment when the world got its first glimpse at Dying Light. Developed by Techland, taking everything they learned from Dead Island and enhancing the gameplay with parkour mechanics and a terrifying day and night cycle. What great news for Dead Island fans, right? Uh, sort of. I mean, Dying Light was announced to be developed by Techland, but it was also announced to be published by Warner Brothers. Long story short, after a difficult development process with the Dead Island series ultimately falling short of their own expectations, Techland had officially parted ways with Deep Silver in hopes that they could fully deliver on their vision without anything or anyone holding them back. Now, since this video focuses on Dead Island, I'll just go ahead and summarize by saying that Dying Light had a very successful release in 2015, followed by the 2022 release of Dying Light 2 very recently that... Eh. But anyway, back to Dead Island. Pretty much exactly one year after the Dying Light announcement, another unforgettable CGI trailer was released, this time for the actual Dead Island 2. Now at this point, you've got to understand, I was just losing my teenage mind. I mean, as a Dead Island super fan, it felt like my dreams were coming true. I was already insanely excited about Dying Light, which was essentially Dead Island meets Mirror's Edge, and actually around the same time as announcing Dying Light, Techland also also announced Hell Raid, which was pretty much Dead Island meets Skyrim. So I already felt like I was at maximum hype with those two releases on the horizon, and suddenly the actual Dead Island 2 was also announced. Just absolutely mind blowing. Now, of course, I did have one big question. If Techland are officially no longer working on the Dead Island franchise anymore, who's gonna be giving us the sequel? Well, remember a game called Spec Ops The Line? It was a super serious, single-player, modern warfare-style game with a well-written story that most of the gaming world holds in high regard. Well, the German developers of that game, Jaeger Studios, were announced to be the ones to replace Techland in keeping the Dead Island series moving forward, but they were going to do so on their own terms. Something you probably already noticed is how oversaturated and kind of cartoony the gameplay looks, and if you watched the CGI trailer, you definitely picked up on the fun and silly vibe that directly juxtaposes the serious storytelling formula of the trailers from the previous games. And this was entirely intentional. Jaeger were very aware of the fact that the actual gameplay experience delivered in Dead Island and Dead Island Riptide was goofy and janky and nothing like the trailers at all. And while that did disappoint a lot of gamers, the dumb moments in co-op were the highlight for many players. So Jaeger's mission was to double down on that. They set out to make a ridiculous, over-the-top multiplayer experience that they wanted you to know that right from the beginning. From the moment Dead Island 2 was revealed. Jaeger went straight into telling you that Dead Island 2 is an 8 player seamless co-op experience set in the sunny state of California and it was intended to essentially act as the world's smallest MMO with PvP events, that goofy tone, taking itself much less seriously, and it also had no actual end story, so the narrative wasn't even a focus. And by the way, if you're wondering why it's still called Dead Island, island, even though you're running around the streets of Hollywood, the developers explained that California was the only infected part of the USA, or at least one of the only infected parts, so the entire state was quarantined and cut off from the rest of the country, essentially rendering California a man-made island. Now, all of that is a pretty big deal, and it's quite the transition from the previous formula, but they did keep the same theme of having four playable characters with different specializations. There's Ryan, basically Sam B, Ashley, pretty much Perna, Danny, essentially Shin Mei, and John, kinda Logan, but with more of a support role focus. 
It is kind of funny that they have four characters in an eight player co-op game, but then again, some of my favourite Dead Island memories involved all four people playing the same character. Now, going back to the trailer, one of the standout moments was the appearance of an anonymous character who sounded a lot like Jack Black. Go ahead, take a listen. Sweet! Oh, dude, time to split. <laughs> Freaking awesome! Let's go! Dude, chill! I got this! Naturally, this caused all kinds of theories to run wild until Jack Black himself did a Reddit AMA and some brave hero took the opportunity to ask him about it and, well, he confirmed that it wasn't him. He suggested that it may be Mick Wingert, the guy who plays Kung Fu Panda in the TV show and sort of is like a stand-in for Jack Black, as well as, you know, his own talents and characters and all that, and it turns out he was right. It is Mick Wingert, but we'll return back to this mystery character later. Anyway, Dead Island 2 was set to release in early to mid-2015, so we waited, and well, come July 2015, Deep Silver announced that Jaeger had been dropped from the project entirely because their visions didn't align. <laughs> Sounds kind of familiar, right? It wasn't until March 2016 that it was announced that Sumo Digital, the guys behind Little Big Planet 3, had taken over development, and from here, radio silence. For three years, nothing. No gameplay, no trailers, no interviews, nothing aside from a couple of Deep Silver tweets saying, hey guys, we're definitely still making Dead Island 2, don't worry, it's, it's definitely coming dude. And at this point, most people had forgotten about the game entirely, yet a small minority had faith that a massive re-reveal was coming, and well, they were wrong. <laughs> August 2019, Sumo Digital had parted ways with Deep Silver and Dead Island is now in the hands of Damn Buster Studios, the team behind Homefront The Revolution. Yeah, and much like Sumo's development cycle, three years have passed and we've yet to see anything. To really put things into perspective, it's 2022, and the last time we got gameplay or any kind of official media of Dead Island 2 was Jaeger's version of the game in 2014. I mean, a couple years ago there was a leak of Jaeger's 2015 game build, but the fact remains that nothing official has been shown to the public for 8 years, and the game has switched developers twice in that time. Now, very recently, in 2022, there have been some leaks, some rumours, some inside information that suggests we might finally be getting the game within the next year, but we'll talk about that at the end of the video. For now, let's just journey back to E3 2014, when Dead Island 2 was initially revealed. Not even a month after the announcement of Dead Island 2, another entry to the franchise was announced. Escape Dead Island, being developed by Fat Shark, a game development studio from Sweden. It was revealed as a cel-shaded, single-player story experience that will drive any gamer to insanity. Not just because the story is supposed to be some mind-bending psychological thriller, but also because it was mind-numbingly boring and a certain someone played it three times consecutively to make some YouTube guides about it and may or may not be suffering from a little bit of PTSD right now. In Escape Dead Island, you play as Cliff Kalo, an aspiring journalist with daddy issues, and together with his friends, Linda and Devon, he set sail to investigate a geofarm facility on the island of Narapella, hoping to uncover the truth about the zombie outbreak in Banoi. Uh, geofarm is like the stereotypical, maybe evil science corporation by the way. Once they make it to the island, they witness a plane crash, some weird stuff happens, and Cliff tracks it down to an airfield where he runs into Xin Mei from the first game, who happened to be the pilot of that plane. So Xin Mei, who was played by a different voice actor this time, uh, gives Cliff some instructions on where to collect some key cards in order to gain access to the Geofarm facility, while she's off just doing some secret spy shit, I guess. Honestly, it's it's really not that interesting, but like throughout the entirety of Escape Dead Island, Cliff experiences crazy hallucinations, and the game does that thing of, ooh, what's real? Are your friends real? Is anyone real? And it does a bunch of double Uno reverse card plot twists to make you question your sanity. It's really not executed all that well, but I will say that the ending is kind of decent, I guess, and Escape Dead Island does have a very interesting way of transitioning the game into new game 
plus. It switches up a couple small things and it does reward the player as well, but sadly the game itself just isn't fun enough to warrant a second playthrough. The gameplay is so slow and clunky and it's one of those games where you can't jump, which is just a personal pet peeve of mine. The stealth and the combat are okay I guess, but both the gameplay and the story itself get super repetitive. They really just run out of ideas and they make you do the same stuff over and over again and I guarantee you'll be sick of the game before you're even halfway through it. Overall, I recommend to just skip this game and read the plot on Wikipedia, but hey, it is super cheap if you do want to give it a try. It just feels as though this was made to give people something to play to like bridge the gap while they waited for Dead Island 2, and Deep Silver even promised a 2015 Dead Island 2 beta access code with your Escape Dead Island pre-order, and it's honestly the only reason I bought the damn game in the first place, and not only did I not get a code, but the beta itself obviously never ended up happening. Now before we jump into the next game, I just want to remind you of the fact that both the Dead Island 2 reveal trailer and the Escape Dead Island reveal trailer released during the E3 hype period of June 2014, right? I think we can agree it would be pretty crazy if they announced another Dead Island title. June 27th, 2014, what is Dead Island Epidemic? No, no, surely not. Another Dead Island spin-off? I don't even know if I can play this. Oh, Cinemoy's back? All right, yeah, f it, I'm in, dude. Dead Island Epidemic was announced as a free-to-play MOBA that uses the WASD keys rather than a traditional point-and-click movement system. Actually pretty cool, but keep in mind this was 2014, right? So like both the MOBA genre and the zombie genre were super oversaturated, so this was going to be a difficult game to sell, especially when it was marketed as a free-to-slay zomba. Yeah, I, uh, we'll circle back to the marketing, but for now, let's talk about the gameplay itself, because, look, I don't know if this is something to be proud of or not, but I put 300 hours into this game. I genuinely really enjoyed playing it, so let's talk about why. Dead Island Epidemic's basic narrative was that the local lifeguard and gaming sex icon Cinemoy had escaped Banoi and made it to another island called Amaya where he was hoping it would be safe, but here he discovered that the Banoi virus had spread and mutated to other islands and possibly even the rest of the world, hence the name Epidemic. Cinemoy found a group of survivors who were infected with a mutated strain of the virus that, depending on its stage of progression, resulted in people being able to retain control of themselves and even gain some abnormal strengths and skills, I guess you could call them like superpowers, that could be used for good. And this was probably best demonstrated by the four main playable characters, Berg, Bryce, Amber, and Isis. For each of these characters, there are three variations, the regular survivor, armored and infected variations. Now, these designs were mainly just for visual and storytelling purposes, because when it comes to playstyle, they may as well have just been 12 entirely unique characters. There was zero overlap between their skills, their specializations, the way that they play, and with this being a MOBA, the idea was that every character was just as viable as the next. Over time, they added a whole cast of new characters one by one, including Sam B and Shin Mei. And get this, Sam B's ultimate was a crowd control move where he just plays Who Do You Voodoo out loud. It, ah, it was glorious. And for the 10 people watching this video who actually played the game, I personally would main between Survivor Isis, Sam B, and The Fuse. Those were my three two characters. And I'd like to know, who did you play? Yeah, Mr. White. Yes, yeah, science. Now by the end of development you had an arsenal of about 25 characters, and you had the choice of two game modes, one that was PvP and one that was PvE. The PvE game mode was known as Horde Mode, and it was pretty straightforward. You and three other players would rush through from checkpoint to checkpoint and defend a flag from waves of infected in order to capture the area and secure the supplies. And you had a lot of returning zombie types from the original game, as well as a couple new additions as well. You got to see a lot of classic zombie types from the original game return, along with a couple new additions, and the finale for each game of Horde Mode would be to fight a massive super boss variation of one of those special infected types. Depending on how skilled your team was, the average game of Horde Mode would take anywhere from like 10 to 30 minutes. Now when the game transitioned from closed beta to open beta, for some reason they replaced the Horde Mode with a new PvE mode called Crossroads, which was okay to play. I mean, Horde Mode was quite repetitive, so it was nice to have a change of pace, but 
It really would have been nice to have both options available and I don't know why they would just take away Horde mode. But now for the important stuff, let's talk about PvP. Epidemic's flagship mode was called Scavenger, and in their own words, it was a PvPvPvE mode. So that's three teams of four players, all going head to head in a capture the flag style game mode with a bunch of zombies thrown in the mix. It was just absolute pure chaos. There were checkpoints that you would capture to passively generate supplies, as well as big boss zombies called hoarders that you would take down as a team to acquire a huge amount of supplies all at once. And the aim overall to win the game was to collect 800 supplies and stash them all back at your team's base. But of course, since it was a PvP mode, you could get ganked. You could have the enemy just steal all of your supplies from you after killing you, and even if you did manage to stash everything at your team's home base, there was a very interesting mechanic where once your total supplies had exceeded 500 and you were in that gap between 500 and 800, all of a sudden, the enemy teams had the ability to raid your base and steal all of your supplies directly from your stash. Like I said, absolute chaos. Like, this would lead to some awesome clutch moments where two teams are fighting over a horde of boss zombie, while the third team is busy just sneaking into an enemy base, disabling the home defense turret, stealing all the supplies, and running back home to secure the win. You could even throw all of your supplies to one teammate and have them run it back, and like, true capture the flags style, or you could split it up between you. There were just so many different ways to win, and even when you thought you were in the lead, people could just make an absolute comeback and steal from you directly. It would be devastating, and oh, there were just so many highlights from that system, and words cannot express how much I miss this game mode, and just how unique it felt to play. Now with that being said, this was the game's only PvP mode. You know, sometimes you just want to go into like a simple 4v4 deathmatch, or a 2v2, or even a 1v1, but the only option you had for PvP was this super complicated 4v4v4 mode with zombies everywhere. Like, it was fun, but it was also exhausting, and it definitely wasn't for everyone. Now, whether you were playing PvE or PvP, the whole point was to earn XP and other rewards to help you craft new weapons and make you even stronger, and honestly, it did a pretty decent job of honing in on that focus on handcrafted weapon modifications from the original game. The crazy weapon designs were just one of my favourite parts of the game, and I'd say it even rivaled Dead Rising with just how insane they got. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what rewards you get if people aren't playing the game in the first place. Dead Island Epidemic needed more game modes, and more importantly, it needed better marketing as well, because nobody had heard of this underrated gem that was honestly a lot more fun to play than it looked. The Survivor Lowdown Character Guide series was really cool for active players, but they clearly had trouble getting people to actually play the game in the first place. That's why the game servers closed in October 2015. The developers, Stunlock Studios, have since gone on to find success with titles like Battle Rite, and I really am happy for them, but... Ah, I do wish Deep Silver hadn't given up on Dead Island Epidemic. And this is just my personal opinion, but I think the game succeeded in its goal of creating a MOBA for people who don't like MOBAs. And of all of the examples of failed potential within the Dead Island franchise, this one hurts the most. Now as you already know, Deep Silver kicked off the series with Dead Island in 2011, but in 2016, they released Dead Island, but worse. But also kind of better, but mostly worse. This came in the form of Dead Island The Definitive Edition, a next-gen remaster of the game that started it all, with better graphics, a newer version of the Chrome engine, and a bunch of reused Dying Light assets. This was marketed as, well, the definitive way to experience the game. And as a Dead Island super fan, I really beg to differ. This was pretty much a disaster. I remember loading up the game and being pretty impressed with the way everything looked. The environment was gorgeous, the lighting was breathtaking, but the gameplay was somehow even glitchier than the original. The biggest example was probably the fact that half of the weapon modification blueprints were missing from the game. You know, like the whole point of the crafting system in the first place? You can't craft anything if you don't have the blueprints. But hey, that's it's not that big of a deal. I'm sure it only took a couple of days to patch them back in, right? Right? 
I mean, how ridiculous would it have been if it took, I don't know, like four months maybe to fix the blueprints? And hypothetically, that very same patch added in the developer menu accidentally that allowed you to enable all kinds of cheats and spawn in an unlimited number of the rarest weapons and level your character up to max level instantly? You, <laughs> you can't make this shit up. Now, with unintentional glitches and dev menus aside, I would summarize the Definitive Edition by saying that what they did is they took the original game and they fused it with a combination of Riptide's mechanics and Dying Light's assets. In the original game, items like medkits and molotovs would take up space in your weapon inventory, which was super inconvenient, whereas in Riptide, they're completely separate. So this was a welcome improvement in the Definitive Edition. Although other Riptide mechanics, like the fact that enemies no longer take drowning damage, also made their way into the remaster, so it was quite the mixed bag. Now remember the way that you would accept quests in the original game, where you hold up a piece of paper that tells you everything you need to know? Well now we've replaced it with a boring generic interface that doesn't even tell you the rewards you'll get for completing this quest. I wish I was making this up. Even the actual quest log menu doesn't tell you the weapons, the blueprints, or whatever that you're getting from the quests. And don't even get me started on the reused assets from Dying Light. Yes, the jump drink machine is cool. Yes, the weapons look more realistic, but all of the weapon modifications just straight up look and sound awful. I can't even begin to describe how disappointing it was to wait four months for blueprints to be added, only for them to end up looking like they had just zero effort put into them. And not only that, but some of them have this horribly loud noise that plays whenever you're holding the weapon. Also, for some reason, the XP rewards for like New Game Plus quests and also the in-game challenges are just completely scaled down, so leveling up is a lot slower, multiple playthroughs are just a lot less incentivized, and the challenges essentially don't matter. Overall, the remaster does look and feel better to play, but it's also just less fun and it doesn't quite have the same charm as the original. The glitches in the original game are part of what make the experience so fun, especially in co-op, but I just can't say the same for the remaster. It's like they just patched the fun stuff and then introduced a lot of not so fun stuff. Although I will say, I'll never not find it hilarious how Joseph just straight up changes race halfway through the Definitive Edition. I, what is going on? I know I've pretty much been shitting on the Definitive Edition this whole time, but I do have to shout out one addition they made, which was the inclusion of the One Punch mode in the remaster, where your fists deal randomized elemental damage and your kicks send enemies flying away into the distance. It's a pretty good time for a couple hours, but it does get old fairly quickly. Especially since it's limited to single player, and it also just kind of negates the purpose of using weapons in the first place. So that's an overview of the definitive edition of the original game, but what about Riptide? It's pretty much just the same game. I mean, none of the core mechanics were changed, but some of the weapon mods still once again look pretty disappointing, and the XP issues are still there with challenges and new game plus, and the only like one big downgrade I can think of when it comes to gameplay is John Morgan's lightning kick. That lightning kick was John Morgan's main attack in the original Riptide, and although it didn't deal massive damage up front, the real damage would happen when you'd kick that enemy and then it'd go flying into a wall and their limbs would just explode. Explode. And in the remaster, they just don't go flying in the first place. They just fall straight to the ground and it's pretty disappointing. Overall, the Definitive Collection really came across as a soulless cash grab that didn't even need to happen in the first place. It had been five years since Dead Island, and only three years since Riptide, not to mention the original games look solid for their time. The world really did not need this remaster. Although on the plus side, if you already owned the original games, it only cost like a few bucks to upgrade to the Definitive Edition. But to me personally, easily the best part of the entire collection was the bonus game that was included. Dead Island Retro Revenge, a 16-bit side-scrolling beat-em-up meets rhythm game? Now remember the not Jack Black dude from the Dead Island 2 trailer? This is him now. Feel old yet? No, but seriously, this is the playable protagonist of Retro Revenge. His name is Max, and his aim is to rescue his cat, who was stolen, along with his ride. I'm not making this up, that is exactly the plot of Retro Revenge. And little side note, Max's cat, whose name is Rick Furry, was also intended to be in Dead Island 2, and Jaeger Studios proudly boasted about the fact that they were the first game developers to motion capture a cat. Once again, 
I'm not making any of this up. Now, in order to rescue Little Rick, you needed to use perfectly timed button presses and a range of special abilities in the streets of LA to blast your way through the hordes of the undead and the un-undead whilst amassing a high score, because why not? And really, the whole purpose of this game was pretty much just to hype up Dead Island 2 and perhaps even provide a basic backstory for Max and his cat, who, once again, were planned to be in Dead Island 2. I mean, Max himself was going to be a narrative centerpiece and a main quest giver, like a vital main character in Dead Island 2. And now we may never even see him again. Anyway, Retro Revenge was executed pretty well as its own little game, and it's well worth trying if you got the definitive collection or if you just have a couple bucks to spare. And now, there's only one more spin-off to talk about. Oh, what's that? You thought we were done with the weird little side games in the Dead Island series that nobody asked for? Well, think again! And I know what you've been thinking this whole time, right? Because that was a lot of Dead Island content in 2016 with a definitive collection and, I mean, by new I mean recycled, but that is nothing compared to what we got in 2018. Take a moment to think about all of the best features of all the games we've spoken about thus far. What comes to mind? That's right, Bird's Eye View, Tower Defense, and Sam B. And I bet you've also been thinking you'd like a Dead Island game to play while you go on vacation. So that's why Deep Silver's Fish Labs came out with the free-to-play Dead Island Survivors on Android and iOS. Now, as someone who has sunk a fair bit of time into zombie-themed tower defense games, I'm honestly surprised that we didn't get this one sooner. I used to love playing Plants vs. Zombies on my original iPod Touch, or sneakily logging on to AddictingGames.com and playing Age of War during class. And, in a way, Dead Island Survivors did hit some of that nostalgia. Not to mention that the art style looks almost identical to my beloved Epidemic. Gameplay-wise, it had some good things going for it. The general gist was that you'd set up all your traps, your turrets and whatnot, and then run around using brute melee force to hold back increasingly difficult waves of zombies. The best part was the creative freedom that the game allowed when it came to placing those traps and taking advantage of your environment. You could block certain paths and make the zombies funnel in a specific direction, and then use a trap to knock them all into the water. And hey, some of our favourite characters returned, like Sam B, Logan, John Morgan, and especially Shen Mei, who, as it turns out, makes the most appearances in the entire Dead Island series. Once again, the art style was great, the graphics were really solid, and they even kept up with the crazy theme of handcrafted melee weapons. However, while the game was visually impressive, it was also just plain old repetitive. It was too easy, it just got boring after a while, and at the end of the day, it just isn't Raid Shadow Legends. Link in the description. Dead Island Survivors was released in July 2018, and sadly, it was shut down and removed from the app stores almost exactly two years later in July 2020, making it the last entry in the Dead Island franchise. Or is it? What if I told you that there was technically a playable Dead Island experience before Dead Island itself? About a month before the release of the original game, Deep Silver and Sony collaborated to create a Dead Island zombie invasion event on PlayStation Home, where you could play as your PS3 avatar and complete a bunch of challenges like, well, fighting off hordes of zombies around Central Plaza, and if you completed all 10 challenges, you got some pretty cool rewards, including the exploding meat blueprint in the actual retail game. I personally never had a PS3, so I have no idea what's going on, I didn't even know that PlayStation Home even existed, but if you managed to take part in this event, let me know what it was like. But alright, alright, we're done talking about Dead Island gameplay, but what about other forms of media? When the original game released, a novel by Mark Morris released alongside it, simply called Dead Island The Book, and it's pretty much exactly what you'd expect from a basic novelization of a video game. Like, it follows the same characters, the same plot as the game, with a few minor details being changed, and it very much just reads as a basic outline of the events of the game. Oh, the characters did this, and then there were zombies, and then they met Cinemoy, and you know, it's not a great novel by any means, but it fits the bill for what it was trying to accomplish. There were also two comic books that released, one by Marvel, which there isn't any information about online, I've been desperately trying to get a copy, but I really don't want to pay a couple hundred bucks for it, and the other one was released by Dark Horse Comics, and it's available to read online for free. I'll leave a link to it in the description, it's pretty cool. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle, Dead Island The Movie. 
Shortly after that breathtaking trailer took the world by storm in 2011, it was announced that Lionsgate had purchased the rights to create a feature film adaptation of Dead Island, with plans to have production overseen by Sean Daniel, the guy who's best known for his work on The Mummy, amongst other projects as well, but... This ended up going nowhere, and in 2014 there was another announcement that the rights had been picked up by an independent production company called Occupant Entertainment. Production was set for early 2015 with plans to debut the film at the Cannes Film Festival. And then it just dropped off the face of the earth again, and nothing has really been heard about it ever since, aside from the fact that a script was written for the film in 2018 by Jason Lee Howden, the director of Guns Akimbo and also a fellow New Zealander. Jason's own website confirms that the script was written in 2018, so it looks like they've just been having something going on in the background, they may still have plans to bring the film to life, but it does beg the ultimate question of what are we going to get first, Dead Island 2 or Dead Island the movie? What a wild ride for a franchise. I mean, for a series to have over 10 entries, you'd think it'd be a majorly successful franchise to begin with, but it's just Dead Island. It isn't Call of Duty, it isn't GTA. They made one game, the original Dead Island game, that sold quite well but received mixed reviews, with every other game being a spin-off or a pseudo-sequel attempting to cash in on the Dead Island brand and milk it for all it's worth, and it was never really worth all that much to begin with. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love Dead Island. It has a special place in my heart and it will always be one of my favourite games of all time. But. Was all of this really necessary? I think it's pretty fair to say that the entire Dead Island franchise has been nothing but a continuous string of disappointment, and yet I'm still here for it. I still play the first two games regularly, I still wish I could play Epidemic, and I'm still waiting for Dead Island 2. So with that in mind, where is the Dead Island franchise now? What is happening with the series? Officially, a whole lot of nothing. But unofficially, insider information suggests that Dead Island 2 may be releasing by early 2023. You've got guys like Tom Henderson and Colin Moriarty coming out and saying that they've spoken to people on the Dead Island 2 team, and they've also got reports of shareholder meetings where the game was mentioned, and if what they're saying is true, we could even be seeing the game release as early as September or October this year. So we'll see what happens, hopefully we do get the game soon and it's worth the wait and I think it's fair to say that Deep Silver should just stop all the f***ing Dead Island side games and anyway, I'll leave you with a little something I made. Consider it a thank you for making it this far in the video. 